Welcome to a special edition of Mead Live. Today we're going to be looking at the outlook for the construction and engineering projects market in Kuwait and the wider region. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Mohammed Al Ghanem, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Hamad Suleiman Al Ghanem Group of Companies based in Kuwait. Mohammed, welcome. Thank you very much for your time today. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. I would like to start uh, by asking you about 2020. Now, 2020, as everybody knows, it's been an incredibly challenging year for everyone, but particularly for anyone involved in the Gulf construction industry. Could you perhaps just summarize uh, perhaps the, the challenges that you have faced as a company and in your market um, this year and, and possibly how you've responded to that? It's been an interesting year all around. I think when the when the um, virus first broke out in China uh, early or late last year, um, uh, there was the question around the degree of the fatalities that would come out of it. Um, we were all trying to understand what this was all about, and we've come a long way, I think, to understand how to deal with this virus. Uh, that being said, uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud as the chief executive officer of this group that we were very vigilant from the outset um, to try to put the proper mechanisms in place in order to ensure that as the um, uh, construction activity was continuing on our different sites till uh, we were all forced um, uh, to go into the uh, area wide and then uh, which was ensued by a national lockdown here in Kuwait which took place between um, more or less end of March mid March uh, until uh, more or less the end of uh, end of June June, uh, early July. Uh, so that was certainly a difficult period uh, where, um, for all intents and purposes, our construction activity almost halted. So um, while it has been extremely challenging, uh, not only from an operational perspective, but also in trying to uh, understand how this relates to us uh, in terms of revenue and in terms of scheduling and programs and delivery of projects. Uh, but I think we've also learned a lot uh, in how we can manage um, uh, under very difficult situations. Well done and getting through the year so far. I think resilience has been possibly the watchword of the year uh, for companies. And as you have just described, a lot of companies have had to sort of move very quickly to, to adjust for the changed market. If, we can if I can just ask you about the, where the biggest challenges have been. You touched on the sort of uh, uh, slowdown in new project opportunities, uh, but I've also heard about you know, payment delays, cash flow issues, logistics you mentioned. Where, where have been the sort of primary challenges for your business? I think you've you've encompassed almost all aspects of it. So um, you know, as as we uh, uh, conduct this interview today, um, uh, you know, we're dealing with with a Gulf that prior to, to COVID, but also as a result of, um, uh, we have had a declining economy as a result of the stress on oil prices. Um, you know, a, a recent study by the International Monetary Fund has suggested that the GCC as a whole uh, is likely going to have a decline of around $270 billion in revenue over, the, uh, over 2020. So it's absolutely um, uh, important for us to understand that whatever excess in revenue and cash that might be available to our clients as you know for our group for example our largest client is is, is the public sector either in Kuwait or in other countries that we work in um, and so as a consequence you are going to continue to deal with a client that is under financial duress and that means that we're going to have to work around it we're going to have to find ways um, with which to deal with um, this uh, cash gap, if you will. Uh, on the other hand, I think what has been extremely telling for issues uh, related to COVID is we are all beginning to understand the fragility of the supply chain. Um, uh, and we're all beginning to redefine to understand what the relationship by and between uh, either engineering construction uh, firms have with their various uh, suppliers and how to ensure that the delivery uh, method is, is absolutely important. And so revisiting uh, uh, the role of the supply chain as now being extremely intrinsic to the delivery of the projects is becoming very important, not only in terms of prices, but also in delivery in terms of expediency of that. So the, the fragility of the supply chain, that's a, a fascinating and vitally important topic. Um, 
what sort of measures have you had to take to, to sort of support your, your suppliers and your partner companies? You know, have, you, have you changed the, the type of contracts you're using or your payment terms? You know, how, how have you helped your supply chain and your own business to get through this fragility? Well, I think, you know, this answer or this question has two answers. The first is, you know, in conditions where you have running contracts, it's very difficult for you to change the contractual conditions that you've already um, have to deal with with the clients themselves. Uh, so, so that, I think, is, is, is a problem that we're, we, we are going to have to continue to address uh, as the current ongoing projects uh, unfold. Uh, on the other hand, and, and this is very important, is this has given us a lot of information in order for us to address these um, uh, drawbacks as we begin to fr pr prepare the framework for ensuing projects down the line. And, and I think uh, that's been a question in terms of our procurement procedures. It's been a question in terms of our um, legal frameworks that we now, uh, how we structure our contracts with the various suppliers. I think. What's even more important um, here is that the supply chain has b become a extremely important uh, subject for contractors across the GCC, I would imagine, because most of our raw material in the construction industry is imported. Um, we, we are, our, our industry development and within the GCC has far more to achieve uh, in terms of relying on local um, uh, production in order for you to overcome production gaps in order for you to uh, have the availability of the raw material. And if you're looking at it from, from the supply chain end, of, of the, from the view of the, the manufacturers themselves, you know, uh, uh, there is much, much fear from what we're gathering in our discussions, uh, uh, given the uh, constraints that we talked about already in terms of cash and in terms of the um, uh, economic tightness, if you will, that we're currently uh, going uh, through and that we are probably going to witness over the next uh, year or so, at the very least, I would imagine, um, uh, for them to procure the bulk raw material in order for them to uh, have their uh, material ready and fabricated and, and prepared to different sites. So it's been a very interesting conversation to say the least, but certainly with the aspects that you've raised are, are uh, you know, areas that we and I imagine others are uh, going to review quite closely over the coming months. So in terms of the, the risk or the potential consequences, so you, you, you've talked about the, the fragility of your supply chain and the, you know, in an ideal world you can provide a bit of clarity about uh, future demand, but that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, what is the risk? You know, what 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 are the consequences of not being able to overcome some of this fragility? You know, how how will that impact the the market? Um. You know, um, I, I, I was I was reading a report by Linesight a few weeks ago, um, in which they clearly stated that one of the biggest problems that we're likely to have as a result of the supply chain uh, issue right now is project delivery on time. Uh, most uh, projects in the GCC are likely, in fact, um, um, uh, it is anticipated by this report that around 70% of projects are likely not to be delivered on time. So that, I think, is the biggest issue that we're going to face and, and, and how that comes down in terms of the, uh, of the impact that contractors are going to have is that you're going to start looking at potential cost overruns or you're going to have to overcome that over a period of time. Thankfully, what we've been able to, to do uh, with our projects, the ones that are ongoing right now, is uh, that uh, we have been able to procure quite ahead of time. So um, uh, our, our, we're now not looking in terms of issues of fabrication or manufacturing, but most of our ongoing projects are, are, are just an issue of delivery, which can be overcome potentially by um, uh, you know, minimal additional spending in terms of potential air freight or, or things like that that can overcome the delivery impact that we have. But as a, I would say, a global view in terms of the construction industry in the GCC, this is likely to impact the budgets that have been uh, put on most of the projects as a result uh, of the time constraint that they will now have to deal with. And so what structural changes are required? And I'm thinking here about the types of contracts or the relationships between clients, contractors, and their suppliers. You know, what, what sort of changes do you think are necessary to, to improve the way things are looking? Well, 
Look, uh, there, there are two folds. The, the contractual one, of course, is, is absolutely important. I think we're, we're now all beginning to understand that there has to be room in order for us um, uh, to take these potential downtimes into consideration. Um, that's that's on, on the one hand. On the other hand, there has to be a, a mechanism with which the procurement process is not just looked at from a holistic perspective. You know, this is one of the things that we sometimes, sometimes uh, face with some of our clients, um, specifically in, 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 in some of the GCC countries where uh, if, if the, the E1, E2 logs that are very you know common in our industry are, are, are not part and parcel of these contracts. So you know, you're either paid on delivery, you're either um, or as, as work done. And so partial shipments are therefore is something that need to be taken into consideration um, uh, in terms of um, the approval processes uh, to get um, the material on site, the material checked. Uh, all of these issues, I think, can be reviewed in, from an operational and also then to transcend into the contractual uh, frameworks that can be done there. That's, that's on the one hand. I think the other thing that we also need to be extremely alert to is that from a global perspective, and literally from a global perspective, there is an absolute necessity for us to understand that it is high time for us to uh, introduce new technology in terms of both the uh, supply chain uh, requirements and also there needs to be a much higher reliance on um, uh, the introduction of innovation in terms of our production um, and also in terms of the material procurement. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, also, a report by Turner and Townsend, for example, has suggested recently uh, that if most sites and you know this is how you then uh, mitigate uh, the different cost impacts that you might have. If if most sites today uh, were to introduce prefabricated material as opposed to others on their different sites, there would probably be a reduction of about seven percent on cost. So if you had issues where the supply chain was then impacted, you would have sufficient room in order for you to cover both your cost impact and then to even bring that down as a trickle down effect into your supply suppliers in order for you to give them more room to operate under such conditions. So for that prefabrication uh, or modular construction we hear a lot about uh, to, to be rolled out, that, that, that requires change, doesn't it? A change in planning, a change in design, and obviously a change in the, uh, I, I guess, the, the, the relationships as well. How far off, and if I can perhaps ask about the Kuwait market specifically, but then more generally in the region, how far away are we from those changes that are required to, to make the efficiencies that you're referring to? We are, I think, this goes back also to the point that you raised earlier. This goes back, I think, to the very outset of how we look at the public procurement process. But this is not just in Kuwait. I think this is generally overall. If you look at uh, public procurement in general, uh, uh, most of these projects are predetermined. Your suppliers or your 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 uh, um, uh, your requirements are predetermined. The engineering prospects are, are predetermined, unless of course they're design build projects or anything of that sort. Um, and as a consequence, you the system is in place such that you are strongly limiting the level of innovation that is available by the client deliver, by the project delivery, um, those that are responsible by the project delivery, I mean. And, and in this case, it would be either EPC firms or contractors. And this, I think, uh, is something that it is high time for everyone to readdress. Are we there? No, we're not. Uh, is it time to have that discussion? Yes. And I think uh, this room for innovation and this room for change and allowing um, a, a, uh, for us to look f at the construction uh, uh, process from a different prism. You know, it, 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 we're, we're not, as, con as construction companies, we shouldn't just be looked at as deliverers of the project. We should also be thought of by the clients as um, uh, solution providers. And once you take a look from a different perspective on how we're positioned on that table, contractually and actually on site and in terms of delivery, I think that'll give much room for us to overcome what, has, what have now become very traditional and uh, 
you know, recurrent problems in the construction industry. So to answer your question shortly after this, this, uh, this long answer is we're, we're, we're quite away from that. But I think that there's much importance for us to begin having that discussion right now. How does a contractor, such as your own company or anyone in the supply chain, how do they get the message across? How do they enable that mindset change for the, 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 for the end user or the project sponsor? You know, it's much easier when you're doing design-build projects because there's, there's the absolute uh, room and space for you to present these new engineering solutions. Uh, that's on the one hand. Another uh, um, uh, issue is that um, you know it is high time as well across the GCC. Here we are talking about the economic constraints that we're facing right now, but I think that there is also an importance for us to have a wider discussion uh, uh, to distinguish between value and cost. Uh, and that is something that's very important, uh, I think, at this point in time, because, it, 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 you know, as we present higher value in terms of the end product that we're delivering, whether they're infrastructure projects, whether they're multi-purpose buildings, auxiliary buildings or the likes, you, you are very likely to find that um, whatever operational expenses or whatever capex as a client that you're likely to spend on these projects is 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 likely going to be a, a offset on your um, uh, operational and maintenance expenses that you're likely to have down the line um, and, and that's a discussion that i think uh, requires more of a culture building process um, are we there i'm seeing some countries that are there um, there are certainly some countries that are moving towards that level. We're seeing some of this in the UAE. Uh, interestingly, even uh, Oman, for example, where they're having some um, difficult economic conditions at this point in time. Um, we're even seeing that in terms of their project delivery and technical view and their execution. But there isn't a regional trend towards that. I think there, there, there are cases here and there that we can point to. Um, and, and, and it might not be national in some cases. It might be certain clients over others. But I think it's high time that this is something that is um, discussed also very transparently and openly at this point in time. That often in the public sector there are different budgets. There's the capital budget for the construction part of a project and then there's the operations budget for the life, the operational life of a project and the two sides don't meet. They're in, you know, so you, to get to consider that whole value you need those two sides to meet. Is, is that something that you think is changing? You know, with this talk about PPP projects and you know longer term concessions, is there a sense that those two parts are coming together or has nothing really changed? Well, look, th th this has a wider discussion, if you'll allow me to, to go into this a little bit. Um, I think given the economic crunch that we are witnessing in the wider GCC specifically, and even across the world, really, as a result of this virus, uh, there is an absolute urgency to include the private sector in public spending. Um, uh, public expenditure is no longer um, a sufficient in of itself to cover the requirements. You know, the global infrastructure hub, for example, of the World Economic Forum has, has blatantly suggested that by the year 2040, the amount that is being spent qua the amount that needs to be spent on the upgrading of global infrastructure annually will hit a gap of $800 billion per year. And this is a major, major gap that needs to be overcome because infrastructure upgrades are absolutely necessary um, for many, um, uh, many reasons, including the livelihoods of the citizenry and those who inhabits, uh, inhabit different countries across the globe. That being said, I think if we were to look at the PPP aspect in general, the structural um, deficits of many PPP projects in the past and the lack of alignment between the different concerned parties, either the financers, the developers, or the investors, or even the private, uh, the public sector themselves, has rendered a number of major failures that we cannot overlook. And this is from a global perspective. And so there has been a reluctance uh, to pursue PPP projects with a long concession basis. There have been structural changes in terms of the legal framework 
uh, across the Middle East, I think. More strongly, I think, in, in, in the Gulf countries specifically, there have been some changes in Kuwait, there have been some changes in the UAE, there have been certain changes in, in, in Saudi Arabia as well, where many of these potential risks have been to a degree mitigated. That being said, that being said, um, we are a long way to go uh, to get a, a clear PPP model. So that's one model that I think we, we need to, to take a look at. Uh, and there's room, I think, for value, which is something that we were talking about, because now the, the question is, as a part of this concession, as a potential investor, the private sector, the contractors, the developers are, are going to be extremely careful in how they calculate their returns to ensure that they have a viable structure, a viable investment in place. So we're now bringing the thinking hats together to ensure how do we yield a successful business enterprise and as a result, a reliable product that we're selling to the general public or even um, uh, to uh, the, the client themselves if it's the private sector uh, or excuse me, the public sector or others. So that's, that's the PPP level uh, there for you. So, so that's number one. Number two, I, I honestly believe that there is a absolute need to begin exploring the facets of the EPC plus F model. Uh, particularly in infrastructure. And this is where there has been a, a, a serious lag uh, in terms of how to get public, uh, a, a public a private sector involvement in the upgrading of infrastructure across the region. Where there has been some interesting traction on this point, I would point to Egypt. I think the EPC plus F model in Egypt has been working to a large degree. We're seeing a lot of multilaterals, a lot of green funds, a lot of ECAs that are beginning to get involved in studying um, uh, how to cover the financing that's required. And, and uh, there are many construction firms and many EPC firms that are, as a result, being in a position to negotiate more favorable terms in order for them to deliver the higher value standard to projects that we're talking about. So it's an interconnected dimension, I think, and that they, and, and we're seeing some movement, um, uh, but it's not enough. So I'd like to move on to the question of productivity in the projects industry and the construction industry. Um, clearly, there is growing pressure on the, on the uh, project industry uh, with higher levels of competition, fewer new projects, delays in payments and things like that. So the pressure is on uh, the entire industry to, to, to be more efficient, to remove waste uh, and to increase levels of productivity. What is your view of where we are at the moment? Is, are we at maximum efficiency or is there room for improvement? There's absolutely room for improvement. And, and, and the more important, uh, and, and again, uh, this is becoming um, uh, crucial at this point. In fact, I would suggest that uh, the, the issue of productivity is now a critical juncture in general for the, uh, the construction industry. Why do I say that? Uh, you know, if you look at the trends of productivity, particularly labor productivity over the past, um, you know, 20 some years, uh, more or less the global productivity of labor has been about, there's seen a hike of about 1% over the past two decades which is a particularly important problem. Uh, secondly, and, and, and this is of equal importance in my view, is that the skilled, reliable labor from a global perspective is now declining. Uh, in fact, the general number of uh, the labor force generally defined in the construction industry is bound to take a 25% hit over the next 30 to 40 years from a global perspective. And this leads us back to the point where, where what you've suggested that, you know, we need uh, to look more on innovation. We need to look more in terms of the uh, introduction of technology to introduce both an efficient market and to introduce um, an, uh, an efficient uh, production solution, I think, in, 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 in the construction industry. This is particularly important as it relates to the GCC because one of the biggest issues we have is that we rely significantly on imported labor. Uh, 
Um, and if we're to look uh, more specifically in Kuwait, um, you know, a group of economy, uh, economists, I think about um, a month ago, issued an independent report uh, called Before It's Too Late, in which they were providing a series of suggestions to the new legislator on how to overcome the structural uh, deficits in Kuwait's economy most of which was reliant on ensuring that we have a higher caliber of labor productivity and labor force in Kuwait, which I would say is very much the same across the GCC and maybe even in other countries across uh, the Middle East. So this is, yes, a very important issue. Where do you see the, the opportunity to improve property, uh, uh, productivity? Is it all about digital? I would say first and foremost, we definitely, you know, in terms of contracts, believe it or not, I think there's much that we, we can learn. We can learn from uh, what is known as lean construction um, in terms of how, how, how that's being set up and how, how um, uh, that as an operating level can help um, uh, our operational activity on sites and even uh, in terms of how we perceive the construction industry as a whole. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the second hand, I think um, uh, we, we absolutely have much room uh, to develop our uh, innovation and technology. Uh, that's something that needs needs to, to definitely take a priority um, uh, in terms of how the construction industry uh, is, is looking at it. And thirdly, I think, uh, yes, uh, there, is, there is much room for construction companies to spend in terms of upgrading its, its retained talent and even um, uh, creating that sense of camaraderie whereby you are investing into your human capital, which in an, for all intents and purposes is really the cornerstone of your success. Just on a sort of general point, the, the perception of the construction industry globally and historically is that it has failed to invest in R&D and new technology and, and sort of ways, you know, com when compared to other industries such as manufacturing. Um, do you think that is an accurate description historically? And are we at some turning point? Are we now beginning to see, you know, contractors investing in, in BIM or drones or, you know, augmented reality, whatever the technologies are? Short answer is absolutely. There is much, much room for us to spend more on R&D. And I think um, um, uh, in terms of our, as you've rightly pointed out, BIM modeling, and if you're looking at, at other things that are now beginning to um, uh, transpire across um, uh, the construction industry is forcing us to rely on a higher level of digitization, on a higher level of, of how to think of this engineering solution-based um, uh, uh, discussion, um, uh, which once you start Start, again, it's all the prism of how you perceive yourself. If you, so long as the clients, governments, financiers, and contractors perceive the construction companies and EPC firms as builders and not solution providers, then you begin, the, the, the immediate inclination is to say, well, I'm building something. Why do I need to research on how to develop myself? You know, you're, what you're building, you're going to continue to build it. But if you're then suggesting that, you know, you're a part of this group that is responsible for you to provide upgraded, more reliant solutions to general public infrastructure problems and degradation, then you have the opportunity for you to say, we need to invest more to solving these bigger problems. The big question uh, is where are the new business opportunities going to come from for, for construction companies? Uh, you know, I, certainly I think that it's, it's going to continue to be challenging over the course of the next 24 months. Um, however, uh, this challenge is, is a result of the structure uh, that this industry is based upon rather than the opportunity that is available for this industry as a whole. So if we were to take a point in case, we live in an area in the world where there is no shyness on the importance of upgrading, for example, our power and water resources. So if you invest more in power, if you're investing more in water, whether desalination, whether you're talking about wastewater treatment plants, and you get more of the EPC plus F model that we discussed involved, if you, if you um, 
decrease the, the, the regulatory requirements in order to then uh, push out uh, these projects as a PPP model, which by the way are, is exceptionally important and, and possible because most of water and power projects, uh, 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 the, the demand risk is not on the investor. The way that most of them are set up in this part of the world is that you know uh, the government is either buying from you your power offtake or your uh, uh, energy production or even your your water production through the what are naturally called as the energy uh, production and water consumption agreements that are prevalent across the Middle East, which which uh, should increase the appetite of financiers and developers and contractors to get into these projects. So while I do believe that the outlook is going to be difficult. Over over the next uh, two years, I think that's more of a structural issue rather than a demand issue from our end. Fantastic. And do, just in terms of markets, do you see yourself, uh, to, in response to the comments that you just made, do you see yourself um, expanding your outlook into new territories and new countries, or does it, is it a question of focusing more on your existing markets? We're, we're, we always, as a group, uh, we always welcome the opportunity for us to explore um, uh, interesting projects with the right and like-minded partners across the region. So we never shy away from looking into branching out in areas that we're comfortable in delivery. So uh, absolutely not. We're, we're more than happy. And in fact, we're currently exploring multiple projects across the region uh, that we, um, uh, we're seeing uh, could, could be of value added to both our group and in terms of what we can offer to our prospective clients. Um, certainly, you know, um, um, uh, I think North Africa is, is interesting. Egypt is, is, is bound to be one of the largest construction um, uh, markets in the region uh, for at least the next decade, given the uh, uh, expected expenditure on public infrastructure, uh, which is very, very important in, in, in that country at this point in time. Uh, there are many other projects that are moving on and there's some traction in countries like Algeria as well. So we're, we're, uh, the GCC certainly are our, our uh, backyard where we're comfortable operating, but we're certainly um, not shy from, from looking at these other opportunities in other countries too. Well, Mohammed Al Ghanem, Chief Executive Officer of Hamad Suleiman Al Ghanem Group of Companies, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much for your time and for your insights. And I wish you lots and lots of success going forward into the, the new era post-COVID. Thank you again for your time. Thank you so much for having me again. And I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you.